Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, double CCIE and a Cisco Press author, and I've got a question for you. Are you going to be going after the CCIE Collaboration Certification? I know that might seem like a very daunting task. I remember after passing my CCIE Voice Lab, the predecessor to Collaboration, I made the statement that it was the hardest thing I had done in my professional career. But if you are going to be going after that certification, there are two things that I want you to know about it. Number one, it is crazy hard. But number two, it is possible. And in this video, I want to share with you a framework for success for your CCA Collaboration Lab. I've got four foundational directives that I want to guide you through that can dramatically improve your odds of passing the lab. We want to get you from where you are now. We want to get you from thinking about taking your Collaboration Lab all the way to earning that coveted certification. And to get there, we need to go through four foundational directives that I mentioned. We'll come back and revisit these in a bit more detail in just a moment. But first, we need to commit. We need to make sure that this is a journey we want to go on. This is not something we just casually decide, yeah, I'd like to have that certification, because this is going to be life-changing. This is going to really impact the quality of your life when you're studying for this certification. Number two, you need to master the technology. There's a lot of technology. There are various servers. We've got routers. We've got a switch. There's all kinds of technologies on the lab that we need to get really good at. Number three, we need to learn troubleshooting strategies. It's one thing to go through the lab and correct mistakes that we made. After eight hours, we're probably going to make some mistakes that we have to go back and troubleshoot our own errors. But in addition to that, Cisco has laid some traps for us. There are some injected troubleshooting scenarios that we have to interpret and overcome during the lab. And finally, we need to implement some lab day strategies. You see, I don't want you to just go in the lab thinking, what if I fail? What if I fail? I'll just see what they throw at me. No, I want you to confidently walk in the lab with a game plan in mind. I want you to execute a set of baseline tasks that you always do in your practice labs. I want you to work through those technologies in a very strategic manner and troubleshoot any issues along the way. Now let's talk about these four foundational directives. The first foundational directive is to commit, because like we said, this is gonna be a life-changing thing that you're committing to. I remember personally, I studied for over 1,500 hours for my lab exam, and between, it was around October 2011 through around March 2012, I studied every single day. I took Christmas Day off, but other than that, I studied every single day, and it really impacts the quality of your life. I want you to decide in advance, what are you gonna do when it's harder than you thought it was gonna be? But if you know deep down that this is a journey you wanna go on, that's fantastic. Then you need to master the technologies. Now, how do you master the technologies? One thing you can do is to get some lab workbooks. Now, I sort of went overboard here. I got lab workbooks from three of the different providers out there, and it was too much. I never got through probably half of those labs because they were just too much. What I recommend you do is to find a trusted provider, buy a set of their workbooks, and maybe find about five labs that are fairly different, and then practice those five labs. That's what I did. I had about five labs identified, and I practiced those labs over and over and over again. And when I would get done with the lab, I would write down on a piece of paper, I did not remember how to do this. I forgot how to do this. And then before I did that lab again, I would review that piece of paper saying, oh, okay, now I remember that's what I need to do in this script for you, CCX. So get yourself a set of good lab workbooks and get some great training. And again, I went a bit overboard here. I got video on demand training from multiple providers. In fact, I never got through all the training. I got so much. Also, you need to get some hands-on experience. I call it getting your hands dirty. It's one thing to read through manuals and to watch videos, but you actually need to put your hands on the keyboard and do the configuration yourself. That's how you're gonna be able to more effectively troubleshoot. So those are three different ways that you can better master the technology. Next, I want you to learn troubleshooting strategies. Troubleshooting is a fact of life in the Collaboration Lab, and it's not just the issues that you inject into the lab, it's not just mistakes you make that you have to correct. Cisco has gone in and they have injected traps for you, and I don't want you to fall into those traps. So I want you to know going in some of the common things to look for. What are some common things that might trip you up? And make sure you don't fall for those. Also, you might have to do some tracing. You might have to do some debugging to figure out what's going on. This call isn't going through. Let's do a debug CC SIP messages. And let's look at all those SIP messages going back and forth. In fact, as part of the lab, you may be asked to collect trace and debug output and interpret what that output is telling you. And you need to be able to very quickly and efficiently use the documentation that's on the lab. 
Cisco understands that nobody knows everything and uh, you'll probably be asked something that you don't know, that you've never heard of before or you don't remember. Maybe like a big long URL that you have to paste in for an IP phone service. You need to be able to look that up very quickly. You need to get good at looking up the documentation. And when you walk into the lab, I want you to do so with great confidence. Not with arrogance, but with great confidence that you're ready for whatever they throw at you. And I've got a few strategies that I want to share with you in this video and some upcoming videos about that. One is called the pole position strategy. Let me explain where that one came from. It was about two nights before I took my lab and I was laying in bed and you might know the state I'm talking about. I'm halfway between being asleep and being awake and as my eyes were closed, I got this vision. I started thinking back to a video game that I played back in the 1980s called Pole Position. And the Pole Position video game uh, had you driving this formula race car around uh, turns and straightaways. And I was thinking about my lab and I saw this vision of Pole Position and it occurred to me that the lab is a lot like playing Pole Position. Here's what I mean by that. There are parts of the pole position game where you're on a straightaway. You just step on the gas and you go as fast as you possibly can. But there are other times when you're playing pole position where you're going around and you're navigating these tight turns. You need to slow down. You need to be careful. And it occurred to me that it's the same thing with the lab. I don't want to go into the lab and go at a steady pace throughout the entire lab. There are times on the lab when I'm going to go full blast. When I get in there, I'm going to map out my day. I'm going to execute a set of tasks that I always do on a practice lab. I'm going to set up my calling search spaces and my partitions and my uh, media resource groups and my media resource group lists, things that I always do. I'm going to go really, really fast. But then there are times when I need to slow down, think about what I'm doing. Let's be careful when creating that voice translation rule. Let's think about the logic as we're setting up the script for UCCX. So there are times to go fast, there are times to go slow. Another lab day strategy is using the modified device-based approach. You see, it actually took me a couple of attempts to get my CCA. Uh, on the first attempt, I remember telling the proctor on my way out, I told him I, I could have passed the lab if I had three more hours. I ran out of time. Now, when I took the lab the second time using my modified device-based approach, that time I had about 45 minutes after I finished all my tasks to go back and do some verification. So what is this modified device-based approach? The idea is this. I don't want you to go into the lab and do task 1.1 and then task 1.2 and then 1.3 and 2.1 and so on. I don't want you to go linearly. What I want you to do is to group tasks together based on the device. Here's an example. I want you to take one of those pieces of scratch paper they give you in the lab and I want you to make a grid much like this. And I want you to have a box for each device on the lab. For your switch, for your routers, for your communication manager servers, for your Unity Connection server, for Unity Express, for Contact Center Express, for the I am in present server. And as you read through your tasks very briefly, not in any great detail, but as you skim through those tasks at the beginning of your day, I want you to jot down what tasks need to be performed on what device. And as you go through the tasks, you're going to do everything on Switch SW1. Then you're going to do everything on your HQ router and so on. And you're going to start crossing off these tasks as you go. You finish a task, you cross it off. You finish a task, you cross it off. And then you don't have to bounce back and forth as much as you would otherwise if you were just going through the tasks in a linear fashion. That is a huge time-saving strategy. Another strategy I've got for you is to eliminate errors. There is going to be a lot of typing on your lab. You're going to be entering the IP addresses of your communications manager publishers and your subscribers over and over again. Do you think you might make a mistake under the time pressures of the lab? I know I didn't trust myself. I didn't want to trust myself to type in this publisher's IP address 20 or 30 times during the day. So you know what I did at the beginning of the day? And this is something that I did in my practice lab just to build that habit. What I would do is open up a Microsoft Notepad document at the beginning of the day and I would very carefully type in the IP addresses of my publishers, of my subscriber, I would type in the IP addresses of my loopback interfaces on my routers, of the voice VLAN interfaces. Uh, their IP addresses, and then when I needed to enter that information on the lab, I didn't trust myself. I copied and I pasted that information in. And as a result, that eliminated what might have been some uh, errors that would have changed the outcome of my lab. So that's something else I'd like you to do. And I've also got something that I like to call time warp strategies. What is a time warp strategy? 
Well, that's a strategy that can dramatically reduce the amount of time it takes to accomplish a certain task. Let me give you just one example of a time warp strategy. This deals with a voice translation rule. And many times when you're setting up a voice translation rule, you need to set up a couple. When you're going out to a local number or you're going out to a long distance or an international number, you're setting up a dial peer, you want to have your ANI, your ANI, your caller ID in other words, formatted a certain way. You want it to have a certain ton, a certain type of number. And you want to do the same thing for your DNS. That's the dial number. It has to have a certain ton. And the traditional way of doing that, the way you almost always see it done, is there'll be one voice translation rule for the ANI, there'll be another voice translation rule for the DNS. Check this out. This is something that I came across as I was uh, doing my lab preparation. I thought, what if I try this? And you know what? It works. Let me show you. I've got a single voice translation rule that does both things. I've got rule one, and notice what it's matching. It's matching a four-digit string that begins with a four, and what I'm doing to that, I'm pre-pending a 444. I'm taking that four-digit internal extension, and I'm turning it into a seven-digit local number to send out to the PSTN. I'm setting my ton to ISDN subscriber, and then, check this out, rule number two, I'm matching everything. I'm matching everything that did not get matched by rule one, and I'm stamping a ton of subscriber on everything else. And then in my voice translation profile, I'm saying that I'm going to translate the ANI, the calling number, using this rule. Now the calling number, that's going to be my four-digit extension. Ding, ding, ding. We've got a match here. What it's going to do is prepend the 444, set the ton to subscriber, and off goes my ANI. However, let's say that I apply this to an outgoing DNS string. No problem. It won't match rule one, but everything is going to match rule two. And what's it going to do? It's going to translate the call. It's going to translate the DNS, and it's going to give it an ISDN ton of subscriber. And I apply this voice translation profile to my dial peer that gets me out to local numbers. And with one voice translation rule, I have accomplished my ton and Annie and DNS manipulation in one rule. Pretty powerful stuff. Well, I hope you found some value in this overview of these four foundational directives. And if you have, if you'd like to go further with me and learn a bit more, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to join me for my next video, which is on building your own home lab for your CCA collaboration studies. A lot of people do rack rentals. That works for a lot of people. Personally, I like to get my hands on the actual gear. I seem to learn a lot more like that. Personally, if you want to build your own home lab, I've got a video showing you exactly how to do that. And to get access to this video, click on the link in the description just below this video and enter your name and email and you'll be sent this video showing you how to set up your own collaboration lab. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you there.